can Crystal Palace make it to the playoff final? All the highlights from their crucial clash against Sunderland Monday night. That's a change of programme. Now, though, if you live in the capital, you need to see this. If you were mayor for the day, what would you change? First thing I'd change, I'd probably extend the congestion charging to a larger zone. Look at um, the safety of London. I would adjust congestion charging to uh, be more effective as a means to uh, sort out transport rather than a means to generate cash. If I was mayor for the day, that would be a hell of a party. The opening salvos have been fired as the capital's second mayoral election campaign targets the voters in the battle for London. Next week, the final list of candidates will be disclosed and Londoners will know who they can vote for. With their sights set on City Hall, we take some of the mayoral hopefuls out on the streets with their policies. show you where to go now. Bermondsey MP Simon Hughes, Steve Norris and of course Ken Livingstone and will be amongst an array of mayoral hopefuls from every political persuasion who believe they can run one of the world's high-profile cities. It's a huge job controlling an antiquated transport network, keeping London safe from terrorism, overseeing the budgets for 30,000 police officers and even promoting the Olympic Games for 2012. On June the 10th, we, the electorate, will decide who takes control of City Hall and becomes the face of London for the next four years. Nominations for mayoral candidates closed at 4pm today, but the full list of those names won't be declared until Monday next week. However, three wannabe mayors put themselves forward to us last month. Taryn Johnson is a GLA member and standing for the Green Party. Boxing promoter and well-known South Londoner Frank Maloney is backed by the UK Independence Party. And Ram Gidumal, who started with a corner shop and who's become a successful international businessman, represents the Christian People's Alliance. They've all joined the main political party candidates in the race to be the next mayor. So who are these political animals? What drives them? And what are their intentions should they win control of City Hall? But first, the big guns from the three national parties. Liberal Democrat Simon Hughes, trained as a lawyer and lives in Southwark, where he's been elected as MP for Bermondsey six times since 1983. He's had a number of portfolios within the Lib Dem party, and he's an avid fan of Millwall FC. Conservative mayoral candidate is Tory grandee Stephen Norris, who once held the post of deputy chairman of the party. A businessman with controversial links in the transport industries, the Liverpool-born Norris was a minister during the major government before retiring as an MP in 1997. And Ken Livingston, the only one of the three to be born in the capital. He left school at 16 and rose to become GLC leader before it was abolished by the Conservatives in 1986. Ken still lives in Brent, where he was MP, the constituency he resigned from the day he became London's first elected mayor. To persuade Londoners that they can make a positive difference, the candidates will have to come up with a convincing four-year plan. Tonight, we focus on London's creaking transport system, an issue that voters will consider a top priority for any future mayor. I like lots of things that he's done. I like uh, congestion charges on because it dramatically decreased the, the transport situation. The problem is the transport. You have to pay road tax. You got to pay to park your car in your own street. And then you got to pay to drive the car in the country you're paying road tax for in the first place. Hello? The buses get stuck in traffic. I know they've put bus lanes in. I know they've done the congestion. I know they're trying but somehow it still doesn't seem to be 
working. I'd prefer to public transport than the car because it's, it's worse on the roads. There's still a long way to go with transport. Livingston in some ways has defined himself as a politician in terms of delivering better and cheaper transport. When he became mayor of London this time, he uh, found that he only really controlled one serious piece of transport, that was the buses. The tube was still run by the government at that point. The commuter railway is run, well, heaven knows, by a complicated half-private, half-government means. So the buses were the only thing he had, and like a child with a single toy, he's played and played and played with it, and that's where the money's gone, that's where Londoners can see changes. And if you, you know, rather as with congestion charging, you may think the money's well spent, you may or may not approve of the policy, but if you ask yourself, can you see something that's different because of a vote that took place? The answer is, here you can. The congestion charge has been the most talked about initiative in London since the advent of parking meters over 45 years ago. Livingston is so convinced by its success that he's taking a political gamble to extend the zone beyond the city centre. Here on the boundary of the congestion zone, you can see the impact it's had in reducing congestion. It's opened up an awful lot of possibilities which are going to transform the quality of life for people in the area and around the area. Every penny that's raised goes into improving the public transport system, road maintenance and re rebuilding old bridges and so on which have become a problem in terms of the danger to the public. Every single penny improving public transport and the road system in London. But what would Livingston's mayoral competitors do with congestion charging? Should they take power? I've talked to the businesses and the three proposals that I will introduce straight away are all ones which appeal to them. No charge between Christmas and New Year. Um, people will be able to have five free journeys, so if you want to come in for late night shopping, cinema, theatre, meals, family outing, pantomime around the corner at the theatre, then you can do that. And stop it at five o'clock, so the early evening business is not going to be hampered anymore by the people who now don't come in. About 90% of the retailers, 75% of the restaurants and virtually every theatre owner is having a really bad time because of the congestion charge. So, yep, there's less traffic, quite right. Meet a nicer class of car. But that's not much use if you're killing the city stone dead. I'm a big fan of congestion charging. It has been a real success in terms of reducing traffic in central London. But at the moment, it covers only a tiny area of London as a whole. What we need to do is expand the scheme so we actually extend the benefits across the whole of London. We have a mayor that runs two Londons. He has London this side of the seas and London that side of the seas. And that can't be good for a city. You know, this is, these letters here have divided communities. There's a school on this side where many of the parents live on this side and they actually have to pay five pounds just to take their children to a state school. When I read in the media that uh, the company Capita keeps coming back to the GLA and the mayor's office for handouts because the revenue raised has not matched the expectations of the business plan, well, I wonder what kind of a contract was negotiated there. I'm proposing two new congestion charging zones. Um, keeping the existing central London zone, having uh, a uh, second inner London zone, which goes up to the north-south circular, and finally an outer London zone going right up to the M25. Here we need to consider whether we should double the size by moving it to Kensington and the rest of Westminster. But that, at the moment, remains an option. First, the government has to give me the money, then we have to seriously discuss issues such as the boundary. Would it be Harrow Road? Would it be the Westway? Would it take you know, all of those core? At the moment, we're happy with the success we've got. If it looks like we can improve on that by increasing the size, we, we should do so. But there's a lot of consultation to go yet. Now, what's interesting about this is that the costs would be significant to extend the zone in that way and the yearly amount of revenue it would produce would be very small. I mean, perhaps only 10 million after the costs of running the system. Now, to be fair, it's not supposed to produce money, it's there to re reduce congestion. But whether in the end, given the opposition in Westminster and Kensington, uh, it will seem the right thing to go ahead, I don't know, but he's been pushing it. We must ensure that we have harmony and that we have a London where we do have everyone who feels that they are included and involved in decisions that evolve and emerge uh, from something as significant as congestion charging. It's a good idea, but let's get it to work well 
in the present place before we try it anywhere else. It needs to be more user-friendly. People need to be able to pay in advance and not get fined if they don't pay by 10 o'clock and should be able to pay till the end the following day. So I think the idea of being a little more subtle with the congestion charging, Simon Hughes's idea, is actually quite clever because it allows Londoners who like congestion charging to keep the things they like, but it also introduces rather pragmatically um, some ways of softening the blow either on days when there will be lots of people wanting to drive in to do their Christmas shopping or when the traffic will be light even though it's a weekday. And you could consider other things like, you know, what about the middle of the day, you know, when allegedly many of the shops feel they've lost money. So I think it's quite a clever way of looking at keeping the bulk of the purpose of congestion charging, which is very liberal democrat kind of policy, but making it more flexible. And of course it'd be quite easy to make it flexible. So I think this is uh, quite a clever move on his part, actually. On June the 11th, when I'm elected Mayor of London, these signs behind me will be the first thing that will be removed in London. Day one, there'll be no charge. We're cancelling all outstanding tickets, winding the apparatus down, and concentrating on sensible ways to actually get traffic moving. I mean, it would put an end to one of the most extraordinary urban experiments that's been undertaken anywhere in the world. And uh, it would be an extraordinary thing to do, just switching off a system that cost £200 million or something to introduce, all those cameras, all that stuff, all that equipment in Coventry and people all just abandoned. They'd have to write off some of the contracts. So it's a big, big gamble. But if the public wants it, of course, then the public can vote for it. This Saturday, we have some of this country's greatest sports men and women. Have you ever heard of Palazzo Pants? They're you very wide-legged trousers. You're only reading that off there. <laughs> but how will they cope under real pressure? Can we not ask you, Chris? No, there is a life long called Ask Chris. Find out in an Olympic special. There's no time limit, but I'm beginning to grow a beard. Don't be mean, just tell us the answer. Let's play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Saturday at 8. Keep on running. Gordon Ramsay is one of the greatest chefs in the world. A veritable culinary wizard. He's about to face the challenge of his career, turning 10 celebrities into gourmet cooks. If the stars do as they're told, he'll be a pussycat. But Gordon's got a famously hot temper. And if they mess up, it won't be just the garlic getting roasted. Hell's Kitchen, coming soon to ITV. delays and no one tells you anything. We just go public. We go on there, we're cattle. There's a safety issue. I don't think the tra trains are very safe because they're really old. Always late, breaking down, overcrowded. Yeah, the infrastructure doesn't seem to be able to stand up. The Mayor of London is in charge of TfL. Transport for London is the organisation that carries out his policies to improve every part of the transport system, from the buses to the underground to congestion charging. With London's drivers forced off the roads to avoid the congestion charge, alternatives to travelling around the city have come under even closer scrutiny. But can we expect to see real changes to London's vast transport network in just four years? transport systems don't change overnight and particularly when with the underground uh, Ken Livingstone and his transport commissioner Bob Kiley lost their battle to control the reinvestment in the system. And how damaging was that? Well I think it was damaging in a number of ways. I mean Livingstone and Kiley uh, were bitterly opposed to the so-called public-private partnership for the tube. They fought it and then fought it through the courts and lost some people believe they went too far fighting it. I think it would have been far better, myself, if they had controlled the reinvestment. I think signing 30-year contracts with private companies to do it uh, pushes it all off to the point where it's difficult to know what the contracts will mean. 
There's no evidence so far the PPP has delivered. So they were probably right, but it doesn't mean in the end that as they lost, they now don't control it and the improvements are very much in the lap of the companies doing the work. The 11. Victoria is one of London's major transport hubs. The tube station alone carries an average of 200,000 people every weekday. Commuters tangled with tourists, straining the system to the limit. The whole area is showing signs of decay and is in desperate need of modernising. Not the best advert for one of the world's major capitals. We took Steve Norris and Simon Hughes underground where they outlined their plans for improving the system. Management can do so much, but just sheer investment is actually what you need to get to say, you know, good service on every line all the time. They can do it in other countries in the world. We really ought to be looking to do it here in London. Two things I'd like to do that would make this system a lot better. The first is to put some air conditioning into the system. If you can't get it on the trains, then at least try to get them onto the stations so that we have air-cooled stations. It's coming to something when you're actually asking people to travel at temperatures that it would be illegal to carry cattle in. And the second thing I'd like to do is to at least try and extend the running hours at the weekends, say Friday night and Saturday night. The key messages for me have always been that people need information really frequently and people need to know what alternatives there are so that if they can't wait for a train to say on this line, on the Victoria line, then they know if the District and Circle line are running, they know if the buses are running, they can make those choices. And then there's the bigger issue, the bigger cost issue. How do you get the new stock and how do you get the new engineering to make us have the safest lines in the country and ones that don't break down because something goes wrong with the engineering? I'm up for closing lines for longer periods to replace the stock, but I'm also aware that we'll have to renegotiate further the current contracts to get a lot more of the stock up to date, up to speed, with the best in the world, more quickly than a 30-year programme currently plans. The Mayor of London, whoever it is, does now have slightly greater capacity to finance these kind of projects because the government, separate from all this election, has changed the rules about how much local authorities, including the London Mayor, can borrow money. Ken plans to continue investing in the infrastructure of the underground, improve commuters' safety on the tube, particularly for women, and to insert even more CCTV cameras throughout the network. It would be possible to borrow money and spend it on this kind of project or to go to the Treasury for such money. But there's a lot of competition for any extra money. You know, mayors are promising all sorts of things. But I think it is the kind of thing that would benefit many Londoners on a day-to-day -day basis and might therefore be seen as a better priority, uh, say, air conditioning, than building some new tramway in, say, West London, where there's been a big amount of opposition. So, you know, you could switch resources from one to the other. I mean, the Tube is definitely a good place to um, fight a political campaign. And if a candidate could offer some really interesting baubles, late opening, air conditioning, if it could ever be done, these are things that I think could tilt some votes. So the political heavyweights have got some big plans for the Tube. But what sort of future can we expect if one of the minor candidates gets your vote on transport? What I'm going to do is scrap the current road building programme and that frees up £1.2 billion which can be immediately invested in public transport and even improvements for cyclists and pedestrians. There's a lot that I want to see in terms of improvements. At the moment, our um, rail network and tube network is very much geared up to getting people in and out of central London. What we need to do is look at ways of connecting up local communities rather than just bringing more people into central London. That's why I favour an orbital uh, rail network, really connecting up inner London and also building new tram lines in outer London, making it more viable to live in one community and work in a neighbouring community. The capital needs that are there cannot be met just by revenue generation through, through savings and better management. And here, uh, in, in, in 2000, I had uh, proposed a people's bond in my manifesto. Well, I'm delighted that a couple of months ago, Mayor Ken Livingston launched the people's bond 
you know, I don't care who gets the credit as long as the job gets done. So I'm delighted that the idea has been taken up, delighted that legislation has been passed at Westminster to allow the launch of a, a people's bond. I would want to build on that and I would want to see this scheme generate a couple of billion pounds, and I believe this is possible, so that Londoners have a direct stake and say in how the London Underground is run. They have a seat at that table. The mayor has to go into the root of the problem, and if necessary, has to start relaying new tracks. Insist on central government plowing a lot more money into the tubes and bring in someone that understands the London, the geography of London and how it runs. What more, the people in South East London need a better transport service. If I'm elected mayor, I will look at plans and the possibility of extending the underground further south. At the moment, we can only get as far as the Elephant and Castle and Bermondsey. What about the people who live further out, like Peckham, Bromley, Greenwich, places like that? Ken Livingstone was unable to contribute to this programme with his key transport pledges, but according to his website, he promises to run later tube services every Friday and Saturday night to make buses more accessible and environmentally friendly and provide free bus travel anywhere in London for under-18s in full-time education. And to make London a low-emission zone so that lorries, coaches and taxis also meet the rigorous standards to reduce exhaust fumes he set for the buses. After four years in charge, what's the verdict on Ken's transport policy? Has he lost his way, or is he still on track? Now, one of these will be fifth or third or fourth avenue. One of the difficulties I think Ken Livingstone will have to fight, and certainly one that the Conservatives and probably the Lib Dems will lay on him, is that he's a Zone 1 mayor or a Cappuccino Zone mayor, and that uh, what you get with Ken Livingstone is somebody who's concentrated on congestion charging and Trafalgar Square and the pigeons in Trafalgar Square. But if you're, you know, sitting in your nice house in Romford or you live in Hounslow or, you know, on the edge of London in Bromley, Kent, uh, what do you get out of the mayor? And I think that uh, it is less obvious in outer London what the mayor has done. And so I think he's going to have to fight that accusation, particularly given that there are a lot of Conservative and Liberal Democrat votes and potential votes in outer London. So which candidate's transport policies could pick up the most potential votes? Is Steve Norris blowing hot air with his idea for an air-conditioned tube network? And is he cool providing more trains late at night and at weekends? Can Simon Hughes get more cash from the government to make the track and stock improvements he plans? Can Ken Livingstone's policies to reduce exhaust emissions from buses and run tube trains later on Friday and Saturday nights win him a second term as mayor? And have the minor party candidates got any chance of making up ground on the big guns with their plans to improve London's transport problems? You have a month to choose which candidate you would like to run City Hall. The Mayor of London has real power to make big changes and your vote could have a profound effect on how London will be run over the next four years. ITV will be televising a mayoral debate from its studios on the South Bank one week before Election Day. If you want to take part, email us, debate at itv.com. That's Who Wants to Be a London Mayor, ITV, 11pm on the 3rd of June.